Well, that part of the massacre is just only just the stories that uh, my my uncle used to tell me, and some parts my dad used to tell me, and my my aunties. Well, how this frogly got to be was uh, our great great father, great great grandfather. His Cree name is uh, just Texas. My uncle used to tell me, uh, my dad's older brother, I guess our great great grandfather brought his tribe from Duck Lake, Saskatchewan, and uh, not Duck Lake, uh, Big River, Stacy P. and Cree. I mean, that's where he brought his tribe from, Frog, uh, from uh, Saskatchewan. And they came up on that south end of Frog Lake here. It was in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, my uncle used to say. And on top of the hill at the south end of Frog Lake, the back then was prairie, all prairie. And my great great grandfather, I guess, he saw that Frog Lake. And uh, I guess he told his uh, people that's where he's going to pick the land and be, that's where they were going to live. So, anyways, uh, they brought his trap to the south end of Frog Lake, but there's a little creek there. And towards the evening, the, my great grandfather and some other elders were sitting by the lake there. They were going to uh, bless the lake. In our culture, they used to use pipes. They would have a ceremonies, pipe ceremonies, they call it. So they were sitting there in the, in the evening to four for them. And my uncle used to say, so after they had that pipe ceremony, blessing the lake in our culture and by the pipe, he called his people what to call the lake. So I guess everybody had different ideas what to call it. And after quite a while, a bit later, I guess, they were sitting there talking away by the, by the shore of the lake. All of a sudden, I guess back then, toads were huge. They were great big. So I guess a toad came out of the lake there from the water. They came to watch where they were sitting. That's when my great-grandfather kind of called his people. Yeah, this is what we'll call this lake, Frog Lake. So that's how my uncle told me how Frog Lake got its name. Mm -hmm. A big toad came out of the lake there. Wow, well, I think that, that's great. Cool. <laughs> but uh, what do you know about the Frog Lake Massacre? And that the part about the Frog Lake Massacre, well, I don't know too much about that. Just what uh, my uncle used to tell me, and one auntie told me here, but she passed on too. I guess the Frog Lake Massacre happened on April, I forget the day, but it was on a Sunday morning anyway. And the story goes is what I was told. Um, one of my late aunties, uh, she's passed on. She said uh, her dad was uh, just a teenager at that time. And uh, I guess he was out hunting ducks early in the morning and riding on a horse and a sow in a frog lake somewhere. And then that morning he kept hearing gunshots, rifles firing away. And I guess he thought to himself that was kind of odd uh, to tune a lot of gunfire. So I guess he hopped on his horse and he was only about a mile away or so, I guess. He's, and my auntie told me his dad was, when he came up on the hill there, he saw all the people already laying around all over the ground. They were already been killed already in, in the, uh, that massacre. Uh, so, so actually, what uh, it wasn't Big Bear that did that, as some stories go, as some people say, it was his son that did that. That was uh, he was kind of a uh, he was kind of a bad guy, I guess you could say, bad teenager, or <laughs> as, as, as my uncle was saying. And Big Bear, I guess at the time, was out down south somewhere. Hunting there, my uncle used to say. But that that morning, that uh, and that they needed, they were hungry. They they had asked that Indian Indians for some food, 
And I guess the Indian agent uh, locked the food up in an old log house. And uh, I guess they had already made that plan the day before. That morning, that, that's, what, that's what they were going to do. They were going to kill what, who, all the people that were working there, the Indian agents and the other priests, I think. And I think there were eight of them that were killed, except one, one, one survived. A native lady, an old lady, was hiding that, that ammonia or, or Métis guy. He hid that guy under her under her dress, sitting in a tent. I guess they were looking for the, whoever was left. That was they were going to kill them all. But that one guy survived. That's how he survived. When an, one old lady was hiding him under her dress and sitting in a tent. Uh, that's the part that that's the part that uh, my uncle used to tell me. And then after that, after everybody was killed, after the, the massacre, when well, they did get into the, they got their food, and they took the, my uncle said they took the rifle shells and rifles, whatever was left. And I guess they were, they had kind of a little celebration because they had food. And then I guess after that, that's when uh, most of the elders said that you know they, they weren't going to be they weren't going to stick around because uh, eventually the royal, royal mounted police were going to look for the people that were that that did the massacre uh. so that's when after that uh, the people scattered all over all over the country some went to some went to uh, saint paul that's where they had an indian agent that's how uh, Sad Lake started after that. And the other three guys, they made it to uh, Fort Edmonton. That's how Obima got started down south. And then that's when, uh, but it was late, too late already when Big Bear got back from scouting around down south hunting. His son had already done all the killing. And some say there was uh, there was another story I told. I guess there was some I guess there was some money they had taken. There was some money in big jars or something like that, or in a big container. And the story goes, my uncle said uh, they had hit that money somewhere in that area where the massacre site is now. So there's money hidden there somewhere, and, and they, that's, the his, that's what my uncle used to say. Well, some elders say, I guess uh, if, uh, as I said here, if that Indian agent had given food to the natives, uh, that massacre wouldn't have happened. Probably everything would be different to what it is now today. Huh? So our culture would have been different, and and probably uh, maybe uh, not too many uh, not too many would have uh, went to uh, the uh, residential schools after that. Huh? Maybe everything would be different now from what it was. Back then, eighteen hundreds, after the massacre. That's what my uncle used to say. Yeah, huh? everything would be different today. Well, that's what they, like I said, my uncle used to say. Yeah. Huh? Well, like I said, uh, after that, uh, see, when the people scattered after that massacre. Probably somewhere, some of us were saying that uh, there, there would have been probably uh, one big reserve, maybe, Frog Lake. But the thing about it, too, again, most likely, eventually, maybe some other people would have moved away anyway to move to other areas. 
probably the other reserves wouldn't be where the reserves are now. They would have probably been in different areas, different reserves. Then probably would have been different names for different reserves if the massacre didn't happen. Yeah, that's the part that I, uh, my uncle used to say, my uncle used to tell me. Yeah, I, I think about that sometimes. Uh, probably, uh, most of them are relatives. Uh, what they say, what I just said, uh, everything would be different today. Because uh, back then, most of uh, our parents would have been brought up with our, our grandparents. They wouldn't have to go to, to the residential schools back then. Because that's when the residential schools started in the 1800s. As the history goes, one of the, the earliest day school, a residential school that started, I think it was uh, 18, 1820 or something like that, 1824. But that was down east, down east in the schools before the reserve started. Yeah. And after that, that's when the other, the, the residential schools started. That's what uh, most, uh, some of my relatives that are alive, they, they say that, like I said, they would, it would be different today. Our, our culture would probably be different, a little bit different. And probably most of us, uh, well, nowadays uh, these young people, they, they, they have lost their culture, their language, their, their uh, traditions, their customs in our culture. See, a lot of us, most of us are there alive um, around my age in the 70s. Most of us still follow our culture. Uh, but the, the younger generations today, they have lost their cultures. They, 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 some of them, they don't know how to go about uh, when they go to a ceremonies that we have. And we have to teach the younger people, younger generations now about our culture, so we don't lose our culture, our language, our customs, traditions, all that, the ceremonies. Yeah, yeah a lot of uh, stuff have changed after the massacre. Like I said, and that's what my uncle used to say, everything would have been different today. He had a wandering spirit, he had a big bear son. Yeah, I guess after that, uh, my uncle used to say, I guess, uh, him, he slowly, eventually went towards down south, towards the States. Uh, there's one part of the story uh, my uncle used to say, uh, that uprising they had in Wounded Knee, I think it's called, back then. Uh, what was his name? Uh, the chief over there, I forget his name, at the time. I guess he, that chief from uh, that wounded knee asked uh, Big Bear to, to partner with him when they had an uprising in wounded knee. But Big Bear didn't agree because he wasn't type of a guy, I guess, to, to go around <laughs> killing people. Huh? But uh, his son was, a wandering spirit, yeah. So I guess that's when uh, he was, uh, uh, my uncle used to say, I guess he was there. Some of the warriors were helped uh, the chief in Wounded Knee. That's how uh, General Custer lost the battle in Wounded Knee. Some of the warriors from here were helping that, that uh, uprising in Wounded Knee at the time. When, the, when General Custer last lost a battle there. And my uncle used to say that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe our, our 
our our parents that were alive alive back then. But today, my my generation, uh, I don't see it, and I don't hear too many talk about talk anything like that, uh, like the the kind of uh, how attitude I guess you call it or something like that the kind of attitude they had back then in the 1800s. Yeah. Yeah, I sometimes wonder about that. Uh, I think about it. I wish something, some, I wish that it was different from what it is today, you know, from what happened after the, like I, like I said, uh, a few of my relatives uh, say everything would have been different today mm -hmm. if that massacre hadn't happened. Uh, well, some of the stories that I heard, it wasn't actually a resistance or anything like that, uh, the way I was told. It was that story about that food that uh, the Indian agent didn't want to give the the natives were hungry. That they hadn't, they didn't. I don't know how many, I don't know how long they. He didn't give them any food. Yeah, that's what uh, my uncle used to say. If they had given them food, the massacre wouldn't have happened. Uh, yeah, that's what one of my one of my nephew was just saying here. For us, our generation is today. It's, it's uh, that's what he's doing to try and pass on uh, the knowledge of our, the history of Frog Lake, huh? so we don't lose our culture, like, you know, uh, our traditions and our, our ceremonies. Like I said a while ago, I think that's what I said, uh, nowadays these younger generations, uh, most of them, they, they don't understand um, how to go about uh, doing the ceremonies, huh? Because our ceremonies are sacred in our culture to this day from what they used to do back back when our great-great-grandparents were alive, our parents, our grandparents. Like me, I, at my age, I still, after the, we were brought up in a foster home, when I came back, to my reserve here, I I kind of lost my culture a bit uh, when I was growing up, because I was in a I was in a boarding school and I was in a in a foster home, but when I came back home here, that's when I came back to my culture, to my my traditions, our, our customs, because uh, as I as I was growing up when I was small. I used to always sometimes go out with my uncles. They used to teach me about how to live off the land. Like back in our time, they had trap lines here on the, most reserves. They used to go to live off the trap lines to go hunting. I think I was about 10 years old when I used to go with my uncles in their trap lines to go out hunting. Hunting um, muskrats, beavers, for survival, uh, and they used to sell uh, skin the ice, and they used to sell them for for money back then. Huh? But back then, money was was a lot of money if you had money. If if you had a hundred bucks, you were a millionaire back then. Like my uncle, I just remembered one thing. My uncle used to tell me back in his time, about nineteen in the twenties, I guess. You could have clothed yourself, the whole outfit, shoes, pants, jeans, jacket, for less than 10 bucks. Brand new jacket, I think he said it was a dollar. Jean, 50 cents and a dollar for a jean. Shoes, maybe a dollar. Those are brand new. He said eight dollars, less than 10 bucks, you buy yourself one whole outfit, complete outfit. Today, 10 bucks, you can't even buy a pair of socks. What can you buy socks? 